Is there a diet that could ease the grip of obesity on our planet? If such a diet exists, it could help overweight people lose weight without counting calories. Furthermore, it would also give people the best chance of never developing diseases such as type 2 diabetes, heart disease and even acne. According to its proponents, there is such a diet. The Paleolithic Diet. In this first episode of my series about the Paleolithic Diet, I'll begin by describing the diet of humans in Britain at the very end of the Paleolithic era. Then, to help you understand the rationale behind the Paleolithic diet, I'll also give you a brief history of some of the changes that have occurred to the human diet since the end of that era. So what is the Paleolithic diet? Simply put, the modern-day Paleo or Paleolithic diet is based on what was eaten in the Paleolithic era, the Old Stone Age. During the Paleolithic era, all humans, including the predecessors of modern humans, lived as hunter-gatherers who hunted for wild animals, gathered edible wild plants, and particularly toward the end of that era, undertook fishing. Paleolithic diets would have varied considerably, depending not only on the area of the world inhabited, but also on the climate at the time. So in order for me to give you a realistic idea of what humans might have eaten during the Paleolithic era, I'm going to take you back to the Upper Paleolithic period in Britain. For long periods of that time, much of Britain was covered in ice and uninhabitable. And even where there was no permanent ice cover, winters could be exceptionally harsh. Back then, the main types of animals hunted and consumed by people in Britain were wild cattle and red deer. Other animals were also hunted for their meat, and these included, on occasions, wild horses, possibly even reindeer, and in some areas of Britain, fish and sea mammals such as seals. People at that time not only ate the meat of the animals they caught, but would also break open their bones to consume the marrow, and also ate parts of the carcass that today many of us would no longer eat, including the tongue, the brain, and other internal organs. During the earlier part of the Upper Paleolithic period, the diet was mainly meat-based. But as the climate warmed toward the end of that era, humans began to eat more plants. Plants from the Paleolithic era rarely survive, so it's impossible to determine with great accuracy just how important plants were for people living at that time. Nevertheless, it's likely, based on records of what plants we know grew in Britain at that time, that humans in habitable areas could have consumed berries, seeds, nuts, and roots from plants that are still common in Britain today, such as greater burdock and cattail reed mace. Now let me tell you about some of the foods that either entered the human diet for the first time or whose consumption was only minimal 
but increased dramatically after the end of the Paleolithic era. The first dramatic change in the human diet occurred about 12 to 10,000 years ago when agriculture began with the cultivation of wild wheat and barley in an area of the world thousands of miles from Britain, in a part of the Near East known as the Fertile Crescent. One consequence of this change was that it led to the first large-scale exposure of humans to the glutens and anti-nutrients present in cereals. According to proponents of the modern-day Paleolithic diet, these are harmful for many people, and their presence in cereals is a reason why we should avoid or seriously limit cereals in our diet. Roughly within the same time frame as wild cereals began to be cultivated, humans in that same part of the world began to domesticate goats and sheep. Later this was followed by cattle and pigs. Just over 8,000 years ago, in modern-day Turkey, humans began to use another new food. Cow's milk. And way back then, it's possible that milk was being processed into other products. The oldest evidence to show that milk might have been processed into other dairy foods came from archaeological excavations in Poland where fragments of 7,000-year-old clay pots were unearthed. Residues of dairy fat were found in the clay of these pots, but what was of more interest was that the pots contained tiny holes. The significance of the holes was that if curdled milk had been put into these pots, the holes could have acted as a sieve to allow the separation of the semi-solid curds from the liquid whey in the curdled milk. This would have allowed the production of cheese. During the same period that these clay pots were made, farmers may also have had the ability to produce fermented milk. Both of these products would have had two advantages over unprocessed milk. One was that they would stay fresh longer than raw milk before perishing. But maybe more importantly was that they would have been more digestible for humans due to their lower lactose content. Thus, many people in those days would have been able to consume these dairy foods without suffering digestive problems due to lactose intolerance. I'll tell you more about milk and dairy foods in a further episode of this series. There was a price to pay for the switch from the hunter-gatherer lifestyle. It meant that humans relied on fewer types of foods and marked the start of a sedentary lifestyle. Furthermore, the reduction in the variety of plants upon which humans survived brought an increased risk of disease due to nutritional deficiencies. Indeed, in many areas of the world, the transition to agriculture brought a decline in health, a reduction in the stature of humans, and an increase in tooth decay. There were other changes that occurred in the human diet. Humans consumed a low-salt diet in the Paleolithic era. However, subsequent to that era, there was an increase in the intake of salt that probably occurred due to the accidental discovery that meat could be preserved by immersion in salt water. 
A problem with salt is that many people are sensitive to its blood pressure raising effects. Indeed, it's been said that the price we pay for our high salt consumption is not with gold, but high blood pressure, heart disease, kidney failure, and strokes. Currently, the average person consumes around 10 grams of salt every day. In contrast, many recently studied hunter-gatherer societies who have a very low prevalence of hypertension consume less than a quarter of that amount. Although it's recommended by the World Health Organization that adults should reduce their daily salt intake to less than 5 grams, many people will find that target difficult to achieve. This is not only because many of us have a preference to have salt in our food because it enhances flavour and palatability, but also because up to three quarters of our daily salt consumption is from the salt added to processed foods such as bread, breakfast cereals and processed meats. Thousands of years ago, another new food entered the human diet. When sugar cane, from which most of our sugar is made today, began to be cultivated in New Guinea. From New Guinea, the cultivation of sugar cane spread to India. It was only after the invasion of India by Alexander the Great that the Western world first became aware of sugar cane. We know this because one of his officers wrote in 327 BC, The barbarians beyond the Indus were able, without the help of bees, to make honey from the sap of a honey-bearing reed. Initially, the growth of sugar consumption by humans was very slow. Even by the time the first coffee house opened in London in 1652, Sugar was an expensive luxury product only accessible to the wealthy. In the early 18th century, the widespread adoption of the habit of adding sugar to tea in Britain and other parts of Northern Europe helped its popularity to surge. This change, along with the advent of the Industrial Revolution and the increased supply of sugar from the slave plantations in the West Indies, made sugar accessible to the masses. However, even by 1800, the amount of sugar available in England could have provided, on average, no more than 2% of a person's daily energy intake. To put this figure in a modern context, it represents less than a fifth of the amount of the added sugar that adults in the USA and UK currently consume. The greatest increase in sugar consumption transpired in the 20th century when world sugar production soared more than tenfold. I'll talk more about sugar in another episode of this series. In my next episode about the Paleolithic diet, I'll continue talking about the changes that have occurred to the foods that we consume, especially focusing on some of the changes that have occurred in the past 150 years. That's all I'm going to say for now. Hope to see you soon.